Well, Stefan, I think we are recording. Thank you very much for, for coming on this on this podcast. And also, thank you for doing it in English, because if we were doing it in German, I think I might struggle quite a bit. So, Ste Stefan, you, you're a medical doctor. You're a doctor of research. You're a PhD. You're a consultant uh, for endocrinology. I know you've got a special interest in, in the infinitely complex disease of diabetes as well. Uh, you're a consultant in internal medicine and you're a general practitioner. Yeah. And I believe you're, you're currently an associate professor in the Department of Medicine of Endocrinology and Diabetology in, uh, in Graz, in Austria. Yes. Yeah, good. And you did a PhD uh, from the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics in Amsterdam. Yeah. So, so you've, you've, been, you've been around Europe quite a bit. So we, we want to talk about what, what we might call natural immunity, I guess. I mean, can you just sort of introduce us? What, what, what is this concept of natural immunity? What is it? How does it occur? I mean, I'm, um, I have the epidemiological view and perspective when I look at this. And the way I look at this is very simple. I just want to look at patients who had SARS-CoV-2 infections. And then I want to know, are they protected afterwards? And how long are they protected? I mean, you, we can discuss for hours about immunology. I'm not an immunologist because I, I think we have to focus on clinical endpoints, on clinical data. That is really what matters. And you see a lot of studies measuring antibodies, measuring T cells, B cells, and whatever. What I want to know is just, am I protected after an infection? How efficient is this protection? And how long does this protection last? And these are very simple questions. And that is what we wanted to address in our research. Absolutely. Let, let, let's go for it then. And uh, I think we should say we've been, I've been studying your paper for the past few days. It's quite excellent. Uh, it's, it's available as, as a free download. So we'll, we'll put the link on and people can get it. And I must say, I, I did find that it very accessible that any intelligent lay reader could, uh, I think, could, could make sense of that. So, so let's start off with that then. If someone's infected with, with SARS coronavirus 2, um, they're going to develop some sort of immune response. Just talk us through it, the type of immune response you get, how long it's going to last for. Yeah, I mean, it starts um, to, to, uh, with the assessment of reinfection, because when we look at this, we want to know, do you get a reinfection and at what time do you get a reinfection? The first problem that we have, when can we talk about reinfections? And usually the definition is that we can only talk about the reinfection three months after your first infection, because many patients have a viral shedding for several weeks, weeks and months. Yeah, And uh, that is the first thing we, we, we have to consider when we talk about this. And well, if I am allowed to start how I jumped please, into this topic, please. then I will we'll start with that. Please do. Well, at the end of 2020, I was a lot discussing with my wife about COVID-19. I always ask her, what is the measure in Austria? What am I allowed to do and what not? And we couldn't believe that at that time, at the end of 2020, there were virtually no data available for national surveys on reinfection risk mm. in those already infected. And uh, I am convinced that this is very important for two reasons, for two main reasons. <clears throat> and the first one is being, of course, the more people are infected and if they are protected, we can better predict the further course of this COVID-19 pandemic. And that's very important, in particular in these days. And the second reason was to, to go into this research direction is when we started with vaccine campaigns, when we started with vaccination, we had a sh sh shortage of vaccines in the beginning of, this, of these campaigns. And it was extremely important to prioritize the vaccines, to have the most efficient use of vaccines. And at that time, it was important to know about natural immunity. And that's why we started to look at this in Austria, because I still believe we could have saved many more lives with vaccines if we would have prioritized within the same risk groups, according to the previous infection status. And well, what I did in the beginning was very simple. In, in Austria, I was very lucky to have access to the Austrian national data um, that were released um, by Franz Allerberger and I could collaborate with this team. And we had a very simple concept. We looked at individuals in Austria who had a SARS-CoV-2 infection, the first wave, and then we reassessed this group of previously infected patients um, six to eight months later, and we compared their 
infection risk with the rest of Austria. And we found a 91 protection against reinfection in this group. So we had a huge effect size. We really have a huge effect size for protection against reinfection with SARS-CoV-2. And this was after six to eight months. So we already at that time, this was one year ago when we released this original study, we knew that natural immunity lasted for at least six to eight months. And there was no sign of waning immunity in our study. So we knew we could expect that natural immunity lasts quite long. And at the moment with more studies coming up, with more studies confirming about this effect size of 18, 90% for natural immunity uh, in terms of protection against reinfection, we see longer and longer follow-up periods. And we do have data now from the United States um, there was the group by Kim and Rothberg, and they published that even more than 390 days after your first infection, you do have a significant protection in the range of 87%. So we know natural immunity, um, you get a high protection against reinfection and also against severe disease. And this is lasting for more than one year. And from the evidence we have, there is only if at all, a moderate waning immunity of over one year, and it will last more than one year. That is also what we know. And that's in particular importance when we look at the next season. So those who are infected this season, they will also have some kind of protection, a very good protection against reinfection the next winter. And this, this really matters. And um, if I may continue, please, I please. think that at the moment with the Omicron wave, mm. uh, we see um, that this protection also of natural immunity uh, really works because you see we have a lower proportion of hospitalizations and of deaths. And you know, in the beginning, there was the discussion, maybe Omicron is such a mild disease. It is not that severe as the other variants, but we know right now that uh, the major reason why Omicron is so mild is not that Omicron is so mild per se. Mm. It is because we have such a high immunity in the population. Of course, it's vaccine-induced immunity and it's natural immunity. And we have countries where we see going this number numbers going down in terms of hospitalization and deaths where we have a high vaccination uptake, but also countries take Africa or South Africa mm. where we don't have that. And we see this uh, numbers going down. So I think we are at the moment with this working together of vaccines and of natural immunity somewhere at the end of this of this COVID-19 pandemic. And these are really, really important um, news for for everyone. And we should be happy, very, very happy about this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The, the thing that first encouraged me when I learned that in the 2002-2003 SARS coronavirus, uh, one outbreak people still had neutralizing immunity and clinical protection at 17 years later in 2020. So you're saying we're getting like 87% protection uh, after 390 days. You know, what's kind of your best estimate about the, the longevity? Do you think it could be years or into a decade or more like the, the original SARS variant? Or, or do you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm focusing on clinical data. So we don't have the clinical data for, for many years. And there's always some uncertainty around this data. We have bias, we have confounding in, in epidemiological studies. But from immunological studies, from antibody data, and also what you mentioned from measuring other parameters of the immune system, we could estimate, we could expect that it lasts for, for several years. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, what we can really really assume for, for national immunity. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned we, we also have um, other coronaviruses that are also endemic mm -hmm. in our population. Mm -hmm. And um, these do not cause a lot of harm to us um, because we have our first infection as, as ch when we are child, so in three, four, five years old. And then we get reinfected and reinfected and reinfected and we build up natural immunity and it doesn't do harm. And um, some colleagues of mine, there's, great science papers about that. They assume that uh, what will remain from SARS-CoV-2 is a first infection as a child, yeah. as a young child. And then we get infected and infected. And when we're old and in 10 or 20 years, you will have many old people, but they have all been infected, infected, infected. And multiple they will not times. have multiple times and build up their, their natural immunity. And uh, the good thing about SARS-CoV-2 is that the 
first infection as a child is very, very mild. So mm. also compared to the flu, um, that's a very mild infection. And we're very lucky that this is the case. Mm. And this will probably remain in a, in a few years ahead from now. Mm. But of course, these are only estimations based on the data that we have. And you know, it's, it's never black and white, white picture. Mm -hmm. But I think that the data on natural immunity are very, very important. In particular, because we know at the beginning of 2022, we can estimate that probably more, more than half of the world's population has already been infected with SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. Yeah. Because what we know when we're watching this data on, yeah. on Worldometer and all these, uh, yeah. these reports on national infection data, we know that we do not capture, uh, we do not capture most of the infections. And we know for if we have a very perfect test strategy, we may detect every second infection, but for the low-income countries, there are surveys or there are meta-analysis estimating that you detect one infection for 62 occurring in such countries. Mm -hmm. So more than half of the world's population seems to be infected right now. They have a good protection, a very efficient protection, and this is long-lasting. So these are extremely good news. And uh, therefore, I think we are these days coming to an end of this COVID-19 pandemic. And um, yeah, the question is, of course, how to digest all this and how to uh, change the measures against COVID-19 and how to balance the costs, efforts, and time that we put into the fight against COVID-19. I think vaccines were very, very important and were very, very effective. And uh, this was really great that we have them available. I'm also vaccinated three times. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. Um, but natural immunity has to be considered. And that's very important. And that's why I'm very happy to, to have this interview with you. Mm, yeah. So the, the practical implications of this are that we, the way I see this, it's almost like a, a, a generating active immunity on top of the immunity we already have from the vaccines. So, so, so like you, I, thankfully, I've had three doses of vaccine. When, when, when I'm infected with Omicron, I haven't knowingly been infected with it yet, but when I am, I'll be protected yet still, even though I'm protected from the vaccine, am I right in saying that the Omicron will give me a big immune boost as well? Yes, of course. I think we, we have solid data from this. There are great data from, from Israel, from Qatar, and also from, from the US. And uh, just uh, yesterday from the UK, the Syrian, the Syrian study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and they, they all show that this term hybrid immunity, so persons who received the vaccine and who had an infection either before or after the vaccine, that seems to be the best form of protection mm -hmm. against SARS-CoV-2 and against COVID-19. And um, I, I just quote um, uh, a paper from yesterday in the New England, and there they they write, well, our finding of greater protection associated with infection-acquired immunity than vaccine-acquired immunity. So it should be not a battle between vaccine-induced yeah. immunity and the yeah. natural immunity, yeah. although the data that we have from observational studies seem to suggest that when you compare two doses of an mRNA vaccine with natural immunity, it seems to be equal, even if not better, for natural uh, immunity. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is very great news for, for, the, for the world. I That's think, right. Yeah. There was data from New York and California on that from, from the CDC that people who'd had natural infection without vaccination actually had better protection than people who had two doses of vaccine. Because the other factor there is that the, we know that the protection from the vaccine wanes, it goes, it goes down. So yep. do, do you think that the natural immunity is going to last us for much longer than the vaccine-induced immunity? I mean, the data on this are, are quite clear from epidemiological studies. So with the vaccines, you have a boost, you have a very, very good protection in the first few months after that, but you have a relatively steep, deep decline afterwards. And for natural immunity, we see in many studies that it's really very, very stable and only moderately waning over this time. And well, of course, know the data from the, from the CDC. And I think this is uh, very important that these data come up, but uh, it's, it's, uh, sad that uh, 
this data haven't been published previously um, because many countries did not anyhow, like the US, consider a previous infection in mm -hmm. terms of uh, any measures against COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But when we compare it, the, the course of the immunity after vaccines and after infection, we see that after infection, it's it's really very, very stable. Mm -hmm. From all the studies we see, is it clinical studies or is it um, studies that measured antibodies or other parameters of the immune system and that are very very good news for all of us mm -hmm. yeah so for, for someone like me that's been vaccinated my vaccine immunity is waning quite rapidly now because it's maybe four months since my last vaccine so that's going mm -hmm. down quite rapidly and i know that omicron is likely to give me absolutely minimal disease unless mm -hmm. i'm really unfortunate and that's going to give me a, a boost which could last for years or a decade so, so the way I see it is my, my vaccines have given me this opportunity to, to be safely infected with, with, with Omicron to give the, the longer term as we move in, into endemicity. Am, is, that, is my thinking reasonable there, do you think? It's, it's of course, reasonable, but it's yeah. um, very difficult for me as, as a doctor, as a <laughs> doctor working at a university hospital to, to make any recommendations for this. But of course, we can break it down to simple terms. I think we all will get infected. So almost everyone will, will get an infection. Yeah. And the question is, when is the best time to, to get your infection? Um, and that's probably quite a few months after you received a, yeah. a vaccine dose. And, and, but, and, we, and we know that the protection from the vaccine will go down a year or more after. Yeah. And we'll make it clear, Dr. Dr. Plitz and myself are not giving medical advice. We're not telling no. you what to do. Thank you. This is Thank purely you. an academic discussion. Uh, yeah. He is not but, prescribing for you. I am not prescribing for you. Uh, this, yeah. this is an academic discussion that you may happen, yeah. to, happen yeah. to find interesting because but, we, but we I, don't know you as an individual. Yeah, but I want, also want to add when we, when we look at the moment that, that many studies that are released that look at vaccine efficacy and that also at natural immunity, we always have to consider the absolute risks. So mm -hmm. when we started with the first um, vaccine studies, the risk, the background risk uh, was very high and a 90% production is about this decrease. Mm -hmm. But when the absolute risk is very low, Mm. Uh, for death and for hospitalization, mm. even a 90% reduction from that starting point is only a minimal difference. So we have to be very cautious with interpreting uh, studies. We always have to ask, what is the absolute risk? Mm. What is the absolute risk of dying, of hospitalization, or whatever kind of, of clinical endpoint we have? And as we see with the Omicron wave, that the absolute risk of, of mortality and of hospitalization decreases in the whole group, uh, mm. we have to ask the question, do we have to rethink the risk and benefit ratio also of vaccines in the future? This will be very, very challenging because the more immunity we build up in the population um, and the less severe the infections will be, mm -hmm. and we can mm -hmm. expect this. Mm -hmm. Also, after this, in this Omicron wave, the more we have to ask about the risk and, and benefit ratio of, of vaccines. Mm. And what we have to consider, what has not been paid so much attempt, attention as I would have liked it to be, is um, the, the, the steep gradient of the risk increase with age. So mm. we know that even if you're, if you're unvaccinated as a very young, healthy woman, you have a, a lower risk uh, when you get infected with, with SARS-CoV-2 to die on COVID-19 uh, versus an older person who is vaccinated. Mm. And we have to consider this and incorporate this also mm. in our strategies uh, in terms of COVID-19, yeah. Mm. I mean, when I got vaccinated, it was absolutely 100% clear that my chances of living for another year on this planet were much greater if I were to be vaccinated, and, and I'm quite old, but if we take someone of your, your age group, you, you, the risk is, is much less. So we have to look at the absolute risk, which really is your risk of being hospitalized yeah. or dying as a, as a citizen of the entire country, mm -hmm. not comparing it to a subgroup who, who've had yeah. a particular infection. It's mm -hmm. the absolute risk that's important. And I think, I think what we can say with, with some certainty is that the risk benefit analysis of vaccination has, has now changed against vaccination. Now, this is not an anti-vax statement by any means, no. but, but the, the benefit that a vaccination might give me now with the allowed large amount of immunity we have and somewhat re reduced mm. pathogenicity of Omicron yes. has changed the balance of that equation. It, it's, it's something that needs to be, to, to, to be reconsidered and because 
I mean, what we always do in healthcare, you, you, you know this better than I do. You're always saying, well, this could help this patient, but what is the risk? Yeah. It's always this, this benefit risk. So a patient that's very likely to die, we might carry out a very high risk procedure because it's their, their last chance. I mean, I, 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 I've defibrillated people many times and, and that's a very high risk procedure, but the, 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 the alternative was certain death. Whereas when we're dealing with, with, with a more subtle intervention, we have to look at that. That, that, that risk benefit analysis much much more carefully what is, is that right did you agree with that is that i totally agree with this sense? and i think this but these are very challenging um discussions but, oh, it's, and it's tasks simple, for the future yeah. and in particular when it comes to children when we know most of the children or so many children have already been infected and the risk is is quite low so there it's very hard to to yeah. say it's is it justified or not mm. that's a very challenging discussion i want sure. i don't want to give any recommendation regarding no, this no we're not prescribed we're not doing that no but we, but, we, we know in my country at least 85 percent of children have got uh, antibodies and of course they've got antibodies that's the absolute minimum that will enjoy some degree of protection because in many of the antibodies will have dropped below the 42 mm -hmm. nanogram per mil detection limit uh, so some will be way below that but of course they are still have their memory b and t cells which which as we've been showing is probably going to give immunity for some years which is is remarkably good news but it's great it's great to hear you say this because i sit here in front of my camera and talk to myself quite a lot making youtube videos but to, yeah. to, to talk to someone to talk to someone who's, who's been re actively researching this field is brilliant mm -hmm. what do you think about the idea of testing people for antibodies or other forms of immunity before we, we advise uh, vaccination do you think see so far we've done a one size fits all and you mentioned this at the start of this that we were vaccinating everyone whether they had the immunity or not therefore potentially not using vaccines to, to the best of their uh, potential. Um, do you think we should be doing um, antibody tests before we do vaccination to take off away this one size fits all sort of program we have now? Yeah. Um, there have been many discussions about this. I think we we still do not have the evidence that this really uh, brings us benefits. It it may seem um, logical on on a first on the first side, but we bring a lot of complexity into this uh, into this topic into our whole strategy. We also have to consider the costs. Um, no test has a perfect um, is perfect in terms of sensitivity and specificity, mm. and I think at, at this stage. Um, I'm not a fan of, of, of doing this and uh, we probably would have needed uh, studies showing that this if, is effective, is effectively working. I think it's probably too late to incorporate such a strategy. Uh, it might have been of, of use in the beginning, mm -hmm. but right now I think you mentioned it, so many people already do have immunity. and um, But of course, it's worth considering, but from my point of view, that's my personal opinion. I think yeah. it, it brings too much complexity, costs okay. and so on into this, and you have to have the best tests. So mm. laboratory tests, I mean, they can be false positive, false negative, and so on. Yeah. And you have costs, and I think uh, costs is something we really have to, to reconsider mm. these mm. days because we have put so much costs and efforts yeah. into the fight against COVID-19 and we have to think, is this really cost effective, what we are doing at the moment? Because, I mean, we spend so much so much money into all of this. And is this money better used for, for other topics like smoking, hypertension or mm -hmm. global hunger and so on? We have to bring everything into perspective in the context and see... Uh, where are our efforts and our money best spent mm. to produce the best results? Mm. And that is a question we have to ask in 2022, I think, yeah. Yeah, you're right. We're certainly not going to run out of diseases to research in my lifetime. And uh, <laughs> I don't think you're going to run out of pathology in your career either. <laughs> As we move to endemicity and, and patients are going to be potentially reinfected with this every, every season, potentially. Do you think there's going to be an ongoing risk to people with diabetes, obesity, hypertension, chronic lung disease, heart disease, all these comorbidities? Is it going to be an ongoing threat to them or is their immunity going to sort of reduce the risk, do you think? <laughs> The risk is, is definitely reduced. I mean, this is what we see in terms of relative risk. We have such a huge risk reduction. 
it's never black and white, as I t- told you in the beginning. So some sort of risk may may remain, but uh, uh, it should not have that impact um, that it had in the beginning, because we already saw this, this mitigation of this of this pandemic. So and the future waves, there may be huge numbers of infections, but they will not cause the harm that we have seen in in the beginning of this pandemic. The problem is when we come to the end of the pandemic. According to my knowledge, we don't have a crystal clear definition what is the end yeah. of this COVID-19 mm-hmm. pandemic. It, yeah. I didn't find it and we don't have a number and say now we are coming to an end. Um, but I think we, we have to rethink um, the balance between efforts, costs, time, attention we spend on this compared to other very important topics. And um, according to my opinion, we are at, at the end these days of this COVID-19 pandemic. This does not mean that there is no harm with SARS-CoV-2 in the future, in future years, in decades. There may be people that uh, that are harmed by this virus, but it should not have um, that much attention and we should not spend so many money efforts mm. uh, into, this, into this topic. Um, yeah. I mean, what are we going to do? Carry on doing mass testing for, for, for the entire population for the next hundred years this is going to remain yeah. endemic for the, 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 there's going to be have to be a, a time when it's cut off so the, the way i see this there was a time when the only immunity on the planet to sars cov 2 was natural immunity then with there was a time when we had vaccine immunity and now that's leading into a time of hybrid immunity mm-hmm. and unless we're going to keep vaccinating people forever and ever which uh, again is just not really practicable or, or desirable we could go on to a period of endemicity where all of the immunity it is natural. In fact, we have to get to that stage, don't we? At some mm-hmm. point in five or 10 years time into the future, people are going to have very low, very high levels of immunity to, to SARS coronavirus too, but that will all be naturally induced unless we carry on vaccinating. That's all going to be naturally induced. And I, I'm just so pleased to, to hear your optimism that, that you think yeah. that's, going to, that's going to lead to end because that, that, that's been my the way my thinking's developing, but it's, yeah. uh, it, it's, 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 it's really good to hear. Now, in term in terms of future variants, I mean, am I right in thinking that um, people that had developed immunity to Delta that they 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 got lots of breakthrough infections with Omicron? So Delta didn't provide good protection against Omicron. But my understanding is that Omicron does provide some protection against uh, pretty good protection against Delta. Is that what you understand? Um, to break it down what we have in the epidemiological data we see no huge differences between all those variants that we that we had so we had the alpha the beta the delta the omicron and we always have to think about when we have natural immunity we're exposed to the whole virus so to all parts of the virus we are exposed versus with the vaccines we have we have only a part of the virus mm. that we're exposed to that our immune system reacts to with the virus infection with the with SARS-CoV-2 we have all parts of the virus and even if it changes there are some other parts where our immune system is primed and is protecting us so there are no huge differences also with with omicron because just a few days ago uh, a group from qatar um, they looked at the natural protection against omicron and what they've seen is well you're more likely to get a reinfection but your protection against death and hospitalization in particular against severe disease is the same is about the same. So you're more likely to get the infection probably with some future variants like with Omicron after your first infection with another variant, but you're you're very well protected against severe disease. And that is what we've seen with with the Omicron variant, at least in Qatar. So um, that are also very, very good news for all of us, yeah. So so my my understanding is there's at least 24 epitopes in in the virus that am i right in thinking so to 24 antigenic components that the body recognizes as foreign is is the body generating 24 different slightly different types of antibody to to those 24 epitopes um i mean i'm not an immunologist and i i have to be i have to be honest i, I want to to stick with with what i know that's fine my, that's fine my core that, yeah. expertise yeah. and uh of course, um, I know that uh, the immune response to the, to the virus, and there have been wonderful discussions and papers of, uh, from this, also from a guy from Austria, Florian Kramer. He's an expert in that. But of course, 
the immune system is exposed to, to every part of the, of the, of the virus. And yeah, so that, that, you have a key, very right? diverse um, uh, immune reaction and many, many different antibodies. And of course, if you have problems with the spike protein and it can enter your body, it can cause infection. There are other uh, parts of the immune system that work, but we should not uh, only think about and discuss about antibodies because also for natural immunity, there is a study from the UK showing that when you had a primary infection with SARS-CoV-2, and even if you had no antibodies measured, you even had a high protection mm -hmm. against reinfection. So it's, it's not only about the antibodies, definitely sure. not. And we, we had so many discussions, so many news uh, reports on antibody studies and people asking for the antibodies, but uh, there's much more than that. It's only an incomplete picture of immune response, you can say, but um, I'm not an immunologist and I do not want to pretend to be one. There are so many smart people there. I looked at the epidemiology and, and that's why. I have no, no, that, 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 that's great. But I mean, it's fascinating to hear you say that people with essentially non detectable antibodies yeah. still had very high levels of protection. And yeah. we assume that's all these B and T cells and probably a dozen other mechanisms that humanity hasn't discovered yet the immune system yeah. is an amazing thing so but the message i'm getting there is you are uh, epidemiologically optimistic that omicron yeah. infection is going to basically give us fairly good levels of protection against any likely future sars coronavirus 2 variant yes i think we can be pretty sure it's never 100 sure. percent we do not know about the future it can always happen that a new variant and so on is, is coming up but from the past we had these different variants mm. so we had many different variants already mm. and always in the beginning it, there were some reports well we have no protection after natural immunity there's no protection with the vaccines it's more severe and we have a bigger problem than before it was always the same or mm. with each of the waves we had and always it turned out afterwards that the protection was about the same, was yeah, about sim yeah. similar. I mean, there are differences, mm. we have to admit that, but it was not a completely different story. Mm -hmm. So I would ask, why should it be different, completely different in the future? We already had these different waves with different variants and the immune system, natural immunity always worked. So why should it be different in the future? Mm -hmm. that, that makes perfect sense. Um, is there any tips you could give me to increase my personal immunity? I mean, of course, healthy, please, healthy. Please, please do. I need all the help. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, a healthy, a healthy lifestyle. I mean, do you, you know, you know, you have to to be in in good. Uh, condition in, in in good healthy condition doing doing sports doing uh keeping your body weight in a reasonable range and uh, uh looking yeah. at, <laughs> at nutrition and um, i've been working a lot with vitamin d and so on so we could talk hours about about this but oh, I, I think... I'd, I'd like just a little bit on vitamin d if that's okay <laughs> <laughs> i mean my understanding is that if, if you if you have a vitamin d deficiency that's certainly going to lead to an immunodeficiency in is that basically correct? I mean, I want to again come to to the RCT data that we have. Please. I mean, first we we have the background for vitamin D that it has an effect on all the immune cells, all the immune cells that do have a receptor for vitamin D. So, uh, if this is of no sense, then nature would have made made a big mistake because sure. we have the system sure. of vitamin D in sure. the immune Absolutely. cells. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there are studies um, before the COVID-19 COVID pandemic that have shown us in randomized placebo-controlled trials that when you supplement vitamin D versus placebo, you have a reduced risk of respiratory tract infections. Mm -hmm. And this was meta-analysis of RCT, so the highest mm -hmm. evidence level that we can show. And, and based on this, um, there's quite good evidence that you have a protection as a preventive measure, mm. if you are deficient in vitamin D, you supplement it against respiratory infections. Mm. So that are very good news for, for vitamin D. And of course, it has enormous effects on, on our immune system. Mm. And there are also some, some evidence for autoimmune diseases mm. for, for vitamin D. Yeah, we could talk for hours on this. <laughs> so, so there's an there's not optimum level to aim for, basically, isn't there? So if you're deficient, you're going to get more respiratory illnesses. But if you've got a good level and you top it up even further, that's probably not going to give you additional protection, is that? That is, that is of course, correct. I mean, yeah. you can 
everything that has an effect you can overdose mm -hmm. so so that is also with with vitamin d uh, but when we when you're severely deficient and you supplement this or you increase vitamin d by natural food or by sun exposure uh, you can really improve your vitamin d status and this has an impact also on the immune system yes yeah. so the, the the easiest part of the improvement to the immune system is the easiest to get yeah if someone's very deficient you can yeah. you can you can just go give that that a bit a bit of a boost yeah yeah. brilliant so stefan thank you so much for that um you've certainly kept me in order and, and reassured me in, in, in many ways yeah. ab yeah. absolutely brilliant um is there anything else that we've, we've, we should really cover that you think think we've missed no, i think it was really a pleasure for me uh, to talk C to you and, certainly for me. and <laughs> um, also have this opportunity you have such a big audience and uh thank you for that i really appreciate this yeah thank and you we'll, so much. We'll, we'll put we'll put links to stefan's paper uh, uh, with, with others, it should, it should be mentioned. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a et al. But the, the, this, the thing I really liked about this paper is this: this is readable. You don't have to be a doctor or an epidemiologist to read this. The, the average intelligent lay, lay, lay reader can really make sense of that and uh, just cram full of, of uh, fascinating arguments for the. The, the, well, we have no option. We have we have to we have to go down the natural immunity route, and I, I just agree with that. Uh, absolutely completely um stefan thank you so much and yeah. um, thank your family for giving us uh, a break from you are you working nights tonight are you working tonight no today i'm not i'm not working oh, that, i'm spending really time with point. my wife and my son and uh <laughs> that, i think you emailed me about 11 30 one night and you're, you're at work so i think you've been you've been working pretty late so i guess you've had a pretty busy period yeah. well, wonderful stefan thank you and if you ever want to come back of course more more than welcome wonderful to have you uh fascinating stuff and great to get it from a clinician who's got the the, the scientific background as well so it's wonderful thank you okay thank you yeah thank, thank you, thank you.